Thank you very much for um, the invite to talk here. What I want to do is bring up some of the ethical and legal considerations using some um, case, anonymized case scenarios, <coughs> particularly in this after lunch slot. I thought that would make them more real. Um, but I thought I'd just say a little bit about how I got here. So I was training as a um, clinician doing adult medicine when I did a PhD in um, the sort of early ge genomic medicine. And at the time, I made some really sort of staggeringly um, grandiose predictions about what my research findings would mean for clinical practice, and none of which have come true some 20 or 30 years later. Um, and I went on to train in clinical genetics, um, and I'm now um, part of a, one of 23 regional um, genetic services, and more recently also a genome medicine center. And in doing so, I, I realized that rather than going back to the lab to discover more genes, I was much more interested in the ethical and legal issues that arose from translating research findings into practice, what it meant for patients and things. So I've set up a group in Southampton called the Clinical Ethics and Law Unit um, that has research funding to look at some of these questions. Um, and I also run a Genomics England clinical interpretation pathway looking at ethics. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to raise questions. I think all these questions are answerable, but I want it to stimulate um, discussion. So in the era of personalized medicine, genomic testing can, of course, uncover familial factors. What responsibilities does that uh, raise for other people? Who has those responsibilities and when? And who is the patient? Um, do 21st century mantras around consent and confidentiality, have you got consent, uh, need to be re-examined in the genomic era? And then to answer, I think uh, somebody's question for an earlier talk, I'm going to talk a bit about direct-to-consumer genetic technologies. Uh, do we even need clinical services when genetic te technologies are so rapid and cheap? So um, I'm going to start with this nice picture here because it's... Um, former President uh, Barack Obama, and he was quoted as saying, I would like to think that if somebody does a test on me or my genes, then that's mine. And I think instinctively that's a very understandable reaction, and that's the, um, the core of many discussions about familial information. But let's just look at that. So in this room, we all share 99.9% .9 of our genome. It is the same. So I think we cannot claim that we have ownership or rights of confidentiality over that bit that we share. That's just the same in everybody. So really, we can only take control of the 0.1% that's different. That's still quite a bit, um, quite a bit of variation that will give us our unique fingerprint. Um, but then if you look at the, the, the variation within families, that's less. So I and my father, share a greater proportion of our genome, because I've inherited it directly from him, than I would with people in this room. So 99.95% of our genome is shared. So can we then say that that is confidential information if something is found in my father that I might also have inherited? We talk a lot about genetic information being sensitive or personal data. The question really arises more and more frequently now is who needs to know about shared predispositions to disease, when and what consent is needed? So um, I'm going to go and say my first example in a minute. The, um, the General Medical Council gives us very nice guidelines about uh, when we can share genetic information. It specifically talks about genetic information and relates it, interestingly, to public health examples. Um, but says that for genetic information, we can uh, disclose if it's in the public interest, um, and the public interest might actually be defined as somebody's private interest, um, if failure to do so leaves others at risk of death or serious harm. You'll all be very familiar with those sorts of um, arguments. And it says to health professionals, you will need to balance your duty to make the care of your patient your first concern against your duty to help protect other persons from serious harm. Um, very similar, of course, to um, debates about infectious diseases. So my first example is a recent court case that has got um, various um, uh, health professionals very excited in what it means for their practice. This is about a man who was detained in a secure psychiatric institution after killing his wife. And he had a known family history of dementia, 
Um, he also had a known family history of movement disorder um, in retrospect, but the diagnosis of Huntington's disease as rare uh, genetic condition was made sometime after uh, the court case and after his retention. Um, and that was confirmed by a genetic test. And um, one of his daughters asked the psychiatric team looking after her father if there was anything she needed to know about his diagnosis since she'd just discovered she was unexpectedly six weeks pregnant. And the psychiatric team looking after her father um, thought that she had a, instinctively thought she had a right to know about this, but he refused, the father refused to consent to disclosure, so the daughter was not told. Um, and interestingly, he was deemed to have capacity to refuse that consent, even though he was uh, being detained under the Mental Health Act. Um, and a year later, the father's doctor accidentally disclosed this diagnosis to the daughter, who then tested herself and found that she had inherited the Huntington's disease gene mutation, confirming that she was likely to develop symptoms over the next decade. And she claimed that her father's doctors acted negligently. Had they told her, she said, she would have terminated the pregnancy. So it wasn't that she was saying this was a treatable or preventable condition, but she didn't want to bring a child into the world if it was likely to affect um, if her parenting was likely to be affected by the onset of symptoms. So whose result was that Huntington's disease finding? Was that the father's result? It was found in him, but there was a 50% chance that the daughter had inherited it. So did he have a right of veto over that result? People have strong feelings about that? Should just keep going. Um, of course, I think using GMC guidance the uh, health professionals could easily have said, look, we're going to weigh this in the balance and we're going to um, um, disclose or not disclose this information um, based on that balance. They didn't do that. They just said that he had a right of veto because it was his confidential information. And as a result of that, it went to a negligence case, which was initially struck out of court um, because the judge held that clinicians had no duty of care towards relatives. So if you're not, if you haven't been referred to someone and you don't have a duty of care to them, um, full stop. But it went to appeal and the appeal court said, actually, you may well have a duty of care to relatives in certain circumstances, which is the first hint of a duty to warn in genetics in UK law. Now, of course, I think there's lots of public health analogies that we can use here that, that might be appropriate but for one reason or another that hasn't been systematically applied to um, genetic practice. And I think that a different approach might be more appropriate here, given that genetic sharing that I started off with. Um, I think it's possible to separate confidential clinical information from shared familial information to facilitate certain data usage. So it's possible to say, look, I'll keep your diagnosis of hunting as confidential, but I am going to let family members know that there is a risk of an inherited condition. Those family members might then work something out, but that arguably is not the same as breaching confidences. Um, that's what I said there. So I think the language of personalised medicine, which we've heard a lot, I think there is a bit of a shift from that, um, may be encouraging a very much stricter notions of individual consent and confidentiality than are appropriate to the new era of uh, genomic medicine. So I'm not advocating that we do this sort of um, cartoon approach where we stick on the back of the man's uh, jacket that he's got Huntington's disease, but I am advocating that genetic information should not be seen as confidential simply by virtue of the fact that it was first discovered in a single individual. And I think we can have some really interesting conversations about how this example relates to uh, public, good established public health examples of, for example, an outbreak of food poisoning. You don't say just because you identify it in one person that's confidential information to them and therefore you can only track the other people who've eaten at that restaurant with their fully informed consent. You don't say that in sexually transmitted diseases. There are nice, clear protocols to handle that very sensitively. Or even more provocatively, you know, is this like a sort of Toyota car recall that actually you identify a family where you know there is a problem? So you're approaching certain families to let them know that they could find out more if they wanted to. Um, 
the traditional view, therefore, I would argue, of confidentiality is not really applicable in genetics and genomics. Um, and it's, it's, we should think of it much more as familial or joint information. Um, I think I've already said that point. And that's uh, for some 10 or 15 years, Mike Parker in Oxford and I have published on these lines about sharing uh, genetic information within relatives and, and, and talking about it being like a, a, a joint account. And that uh, last publication is specifically about that ABC case. But of course, the duty to warn, if it if is established in UK law, will depend on the size of the risk and the interventions available. And that's really pertinent to genomics because we've heard a lot about uh, different risk factors um, and different levels of certainty. And we know that for Huntington's disease, it's a real classic genetic example that people often don't want to know they've got Huntington's. So we need to respect that as well. We need to think about people's right not to know. I've put that in inverted commas because I think it's really difficult to exercise that right without knowing there is something not to know and then you can't exercise it in the first place. Um, I wonder whether a, the ABC case would have been different had it been, a, say, a breast cancer gene family or a bowel cancer gene family which is more treatable, preventable. Um, but using that word treatable, actionable, clinical utility to decide about disclosure is not as easy as it sounds. And there's some very... Um, good research examples that lay and professional groups define those very differently. And there's a, a rather stark example from a direct-to-consumer test in America called Simplified Genetics that markets testing for APOE4 in children as an actionable test. Now, APOE4, uh, some of you will know, is the only marker linked to Alzheimer's disease. Um, if you have two APOE4 alleles, you have a high risk of Alzheimer's disease. If you have one allele, you don't have much of a risk at all. Um, in children, there is no risk. So marketing this as actionable, I think, is outrageous. But it's clearly that their definition of actionability is, is different. And I think a lot of patients say to us, knowledge alone has clinical utility for me. So I just want to know. So then it becomes very difficult to define it. Um, and, of course, the ABC case highlighted that pre prevention of transmission to future generations was one aim for disclosure. Okay, example two. I might, uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but um, I'll go through this one pretty quickly. Darren's got severe um, global developmental delay and neurological problems. And the paediatric neurologist request exome testing, their precursor to whole genome testing, as part of their mainstreaming um, uh, exercise. Darren's in foster care and the biological mother does not engage with requests um, to um, speak with her and also get a sample from her. But an X-linked genetic condition is then diagnosed in Darren, um, who died some months before the result was available. And because it's an X-linked condition, it's very likely that the biological mother is a carrier and that other children of hers are therefore at risk also. Um, there was, as I say, no contact is this therefore also her result because it has implications for her? The neurologists say it's not our responsibility. She didn't sign a consent form, so we really don't feel we can approach her. We do try to approach her, and after chasing various um, uh, social services, we, we find contact details for the mother. Um, she's just had another son, and he shows signs of having the same condition. So I just leave that one with you while I go on to... Um, uh, to, to talk a bit about this no consent. We, didn't, we, we haven't got consent, so therefore we can't do anything. And I think we see that increasingly in clinical practice, this yes, no toggle for consent. Um, so I wonder how many of you have seen one of those and just pressed agree without looking at the small print. And it will put your hand up if you've looked at all the terms and conditions. Uh, this, you might be able to see at the back, was a really interesting... Um, social science experiment where um, they uh, created a Wi-Fi called Herod Wi-Fi, I think, um, and the, um, the small print said that you had to give up your firstborn child if you um, took part in that Wi-Fi network, and they had to stop that experiment early because so many people signed up for it, <laughs> having not read the... Um, so, is that consent? Um, I think most of us would say that's probably not real consent. We just assume that the terms and conditions are reasonable. Um, 
And so the next question is, can consent do all the work in this very complex area? And I really think it can't. That's not to say consent's out the window and it's not important, but if we rely on it to do absolutely everything, then we're really um, tying ourselves up in knots. Um, and consent, of course, also means different things in different settings. So if you look at clinical consent, it's all about the, uh, um, the, uh, the risks and benefits of the treatment um, that's deemed necessary. So I'm about to burst my appendix, and I need to know what the risks of the operations are compared to the risks of not having an operation. And it's usually, although in that situation I might sign a consent form, consent is just one part of the clinical relationship involving trust. It's not all down to um, the consent process. But of course in research, because it's come through a very different route, um, uh, the focus is very much on altruism, information giving, minimizing risks, and following Helsinki principles. And it's a much more contractual um, agreement where it's all down to whether you've signed a, a, a written consent form in triplicate. And there are, they are hugely different governance procedures for those two routes. But in genomics, you cannot distinguish well between research and clinical practice. So there's a real clash there of governance systems that we need to uh, negotiate as we go forward. I think this is pretty obvious to this audience. Consent is not consent unless it's voluntarily given, um, unless it's fully informed, in brackets fully again, um, and um, unless the person who's giving it has capacity. So here are just some problems with that in uh, genomics, because in the 100,000 Genomes Project, for example, you can only get your clinical diagnosis if you also take part in research. There's very good reasons for that, and as I've just said, they're inextricably linked. But arguably, that's not entirely voluntary. Does that matter? Um, also, healthcare professionals should not withhold any information if you want to give full, um, uh, if you want to get fully informed consent. But again, that's not really practical in genomics because even the experts aren't fully informed about all aspects of genomics. Um, and um, a person must have capacity to decide and be able to use the information to make an informed choice. Well, that's almost impossible as well because um, there's so much uncertainty in genomics, but uh, in the context of a very deterministic debate about genetics. So my third example is Katie, who's a two-year-old girl with developmental delay and dysmorphic features. Um, so a precursor to a whole genome test finds no explanation for her current problems, but does find a big deletion of the BRCA1 gene. Now that means that in the future, she has a high risk of breast cancer and indeed of ovarian cancer. Um, but over the next 10 to 20 years, her risk is as good as zero. So the question is who should be told and when? Should she be told now? Should she be told later? In, in which case, how do we store that sort of information? Or are there risks to other family members that, need to be, that mean this needs to be disclosed now? So she may have inherited it from her mother who might benefit from knowing so that she can have surveillance and preventative options that she's otherwise not aware of. But establishing that means that you have to disclose to the mother why you're also wanting to test her and what you found in Katie. Katie would now be offered whole genome sequencing in the context of trio testing, which I'm sure Tom talked about earlier, and I'm sorry I missed your talk, is that, uh, is that you have a sample from the child, but also from both parents to inform uh, the interpretation in the child. And that in turn, I think, means that we have obligations to the parents that we're testing in order to diagnose the child. So I think this has huge implications for practice, for cascades, testing and surveillance, for recording and recontact responsibility. So GPs, as, as you well know, uh, record, um, are very good at recording current problems and past problems, but have no systematic way of recording future problems and recontacting people to say, right now you need to go for screening from a result that we determined uh, 20 years ago. Can all this be covered in a consent process that's uh, summarized by a tick box? How do we respect confidences here? No easy answers, but I think highlighting the complexity helps us to get to the answers. We did some research in the um, cells group in Southampton, uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust, 
that looked particularly at consent and confidentiality. And uh, um, I'm not going to go over the research in detail, but uh, what I will tell you is that the findings were very interesting in that patients were much more supportive of a familial approach than the clinicians looking after them. There was a real discrepancy between what the patients thought and what the, their uh, clinicians thought that they could do. Patients thought that very, very broad harms justified disclosure without any consent, whereas clinicians tied themselves in knots, worrying that familial and personal information could not be separated and that there were legal issues that prevented them from disclosing um, such information. And we had um, a form that was recommended by Professional Guidance for Genetic Practice back in 2011. Don't look at the whole form, and I'm sorry it's so small, but what we are really saying is, um, if you want a genetic test, we assume that you're buying into some presumptions about a genetic service. And one of those is that if we find something in you that's relevant for family members, that we'll be able to use that information, if appropriate, without going back to you and re-seeking your consent. And that form as a presumption works really well. Most people are very happy to sign up to that. The few people that have questions about it are happy to sign up to it after you have a discussion with them. But what's really interesting is that the governance departments and the, uh, the staff of 21 out of 23 regional genetic services felt they needed to change that presumption to a yes-no box um, and, uh, and add other riders to it so that the whole consent process became a, a much more restrictive and unworkable <coughs> um, uh, issue where people were ticking the no box just because they weren't quite sure what was being asked to them. Um, um, and, and arguably that then isn't informed refusal. And an example from the 100,000 Genomes projects that we've found in Wessex is that people are very happy with the detailed information that they get and they trust their healthcare professional um, to be doing the right thing in ordering this genomic test. Um, but if we're expecting consent to do all the work, then we're in trouble. And that's because in the first roughly 1,000 uh, participants in Wessex, only about 20% could recall whether or not they had consented to additional findings, uh, which are the extra findings that are that uh, are looked for in the, in the 100,000 Genome Project. And this figure dropped to 10% after six months. And some people remembered wrongly, i.e. they thought they had ticked the box for additional findings when they hadn't, and vice versa. And worryingly, only 30% of people had any notion of what additional findings were. So these people um, on objective tests of, of knowledge retention had not really consented to this test. But they all felt they had consented, and none of them minded not being able to recall the exact details of that consent. And that, in fact, is very similar to research by Nina Hallowell um, about some 10 years ago, where she looked at people taking part in NHS screening services or in, uh, an, in uh, research screening services, and more people remembered wrongly than correctly, but they didn't mind. Um, and these are some of the publications um, from that research approaching confidentiality at a familial level in genomic medicine. Um, is this knowledge mine and nobody else's? I don't feel that, a quote from a patient. Um, and some of this uh, was summarized in uh, the um, uh, annual report from the chief medical officer called Generation Genome. And that was really interesting because it highlighted this aspect of the NHS um, really being set up as a, a social contract where solidarity and altruism were to be encouraged and where consent should be seen as only one part of a much richer ethics ecosystem, um, along with respect, fair treatment, and uh, penalties if, uh, if there was willful uh, wrongdoing by health professionals. So um, I think alone consent can't do the job. We, we worry about being paternalistic, um, and therefore we want consent to do more work than it can. But a yes-no toggle to consent may run as many risks as not paying consent any respect at all, I would argue. It's my last example, uh, and this was of a genetic test uh, being given as a Christmas present. <laughs> so this was, uh, is a true story, so, but uh, obviously I obviously have changed some of the details. Um, Angela didn't know her father and always wondered what part of the world he came from because people said, oh, um, you know, have you got Italian ancestry or... So her husband gave her um, 
uh, an ancestry kit as a Christmas present, um, which she did. She um, didn't think the results were that interesting. She was of mixed ancestry, as of course we all are. Um, but what she did do was go online and realize there were lots of online companies who promised to do a secondary analysis of the data from that test for health purposes. So that costs about 50 quid. You can send it off. And she actually spent three lots of 50 quid and sent it to three different companies um, to interpret the data from that um, test. And all three reported finding a pathogenic BRCA1 mutation. So the breast cancer gene, one, the Angelina Jolie gene, that causes a high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Angela's friend put her in contact with a surgeon who was very willing to organize a bilateral risk-reducing mastectomy and a salpinga oophorectomy as a risk-reducing measure for this finding. Her GP uh, did persuade her to go and see a genetic service to talk about uh, this finding and what it meant for them. And I think the GP was very aware that this had gone straight to, from an uh, over-the-counter test to Angela and was rather concerned about these operations that were lined up. And our NHS genetic laboratory could not find the mutation. Now, first of all, it thought there must be a sample mix-up. So it asked for a, a, a fresh sample, and again, no mutation was found. And then the lab looked at identity testing, i.e. it looked at other markers around that finding to see whether actually she'd got someone else's result altogether, um, and found that the sample was from her, but that actually the, the initial direct-to-consumer um, test had labelled an artefact as a positive result. And all three companies, of course, were working on that primary data, and so they all came up with the same result. And Angela very understandably says, well, I, how do I know which is the right result? How, why do I trust yours any more than uh, the, the first test? Should I have the operations just in case? I thought genetic testing was clear cut, as do many people. These issues we have talked about um, uh, for a long time in something called the Genetics Forum, um, which was a, uh, is a sort of equivalent to an ethics research laboratory that had been running since 2011, uh, 2001. It was first uh, set up a, as a one-day meeting where we thought um, if we talk about all the ethical issues that arise in genetics and we'll sort them out, we'll write a report and people will know what to do. But there was so much demand for more meetings because these issues were coming up regularly that we've since been holding three yearly annual meetings across the UK to present difficult cases and to talk about how we might resolve these issues in uh, practice. So our aim is to provide practical ethics support involving relevant legal issues um, to improve ethical standards in care. Um, anyone is welcome. We are very pleased that we've just got extra funding from the uh, Wellcome Trust to support that. Um, but we've had quite a lot of output in terms of um, publications and guidance from this forum to disseminate for, for wider practice. I'm just going to flash that up at you. That is a guidance uh, from the Joint Committee for Medical Genomics, or Genomics and Medicine, I think it's called itself now, um, to look at consent and confidentiality in clinical genetic practice. It's going to be, um, the third edition will be out early in the new year, um, obviously now for genomic practice, not just genetic practice, um, and they, um, those revisions are being, in the process of being ratified at the moment. Um, so a very quick whistle-stop tour um, to show you that the road from genomic research to clinical utility is a long and winding road, much more winding than I thought it was in the early 1990s. Uh, but there are no roadblocks along the way. And uh, if there are any uh, false turns or cul-de-sacs, then I think with a coherent ethical approach, we can reverse out of those and carry on going up the road. I think genomics will continue to present us with unclear, uncertain results about which it's not clear what consent has been given or indeed is appropriate, who has an interest in those results or when someone should be told. I think we have a lot of lessons um, from public health that we could use to create an ethics ecosystem that's suitable for generation genome. Um, and I'd very much welcome your input into that. Thank you very much.